Okay, hi, uh, good evening everyone. Uh, today we have a very special guest. Uh, for people who are joining this for the first time, uh, IMC and the Young Leaders Forum has put this uh, series together of uh, speakers coming from various fields, uh, early stage, growth stage entrepreneurs, uh, venture capitalists, um, uh, to cover various aspects of a startup and a venture's journey. Uh, our essence is that this will add tremendous value to all the early stage and young stage entrepreneurs out there, uh, particularly amidst uh, such changing times. Amongst us, our speaker today is a, a very uh, special guest, has a fairly uh, diversified experience across India, across America, both operational and venture stints. Uh, Sandeep, uh, welcome. Uh, just to quickly introduce Sandeep, Sandeep is the founder and partner at Lightbox Ventures. Lightbox has made some very exciting investments over the last 14 years in companies like um, InfoEd, CityFlow, Bombay Shirt Company, Dunzo, Xeno Health, Inmobi, ClearTrip, where Sandeep also played the stint as a CEO, Rebel Foods, uh, amongst others. Sandeep completed his undergrad and MBA from Wharton. He started his career at Credit Suisse and has had multiple exciting stints. Uh, as I said, both operational and venture. Um, uh, earlier with Interactive Corp, Sherpalu Ventures, and then with Lightbox. Um, uh, with this, Sandeep, uh, I hand it over to you. The way that we'll structure it is Sandeep is speaking on uh, the particular aspect of brand building, consumer acquisition, and marketing in a venture's journey. Um, Sandeep will run us through his thoughts, and then we will uh, uh, do a Q&A. &A. I would request everyone uh, to post the questions. Uh, the team will consolidate the questions during uh, uh, this session, uh, and uh, 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 we would uh, ask Sandeep those questions on your behalf. Sandeep, with that, over to you. Very excited to have you. Hey, Sandeep, you're on mute, I guess. Hi, right, guys. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, thanks. Yash, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for this opportunity. I think it's always a, a pleasure to just come out and talk to, well, sing home, I guess, and talk to uh, a group of people about what we're up to and just uh, try to provide a different perspective on how perhaps to look at the world. So. Yeah, I've got a lot of slides and uh, the reality is I don't want to spend as much time on them. So I'm going to go through it very quickly. And uh, yes, I guess maybe the, as, a, as a format, then I assume we'll chat a little bit and then I guess we'll take questions from, from the audience. Is that right? Yes. Okay, great. So um, look, as a fund, uh, our, our model is to invest basically on four broad themes where, where we see technology um, as a core differentiator in a business. Um, brand is an aspect that we think accelerates and changes the value of a company. We look for business models that are truly uh, disruptive in the spaces that they're operating in. And I'll talk a little bit more about how that works in a bit. And I think the fourth pillar, which has become really important in the last year that we um, started to talk about and explore about two years ago and have built on is really sustainability. Now, these are the four things that we look for. And these are the four aspects that uh, kind of underpin the, the companies we look at. From a, with the way we operate, um, you know, venture is considered often a, a business of betting and uh, making lots of bets and let's see where they play out. I think that we'd like to look at it a little bit differently and really say that, look, we want to build these businesses. We, we, we claim and, and we, we strive to have deep operational involvement in our businesses. And to do that, we have structured our portfolio so that it is very small. So we only have eight companies per fund. We invest very early. Uh, as a result of that early investment, we usually are significant owners in the business, which means our future is significantly tied to the future uh, as, as the entrepreneurs is. And um, we rely heavily on data and tech to help us make the decisions and, and ensure that we're creating the right type of businesses as we go forward. Um, there's this idea that really good stories beat a good spreadsheet. And I think that that's a, an important thought to keep in mind. I think the, the audience here is largely young entrepreneurs. And, and I think it's uh, always important to remember that you know, it's not about the, the, the equations and the numbers that really attract someone to something. It's 
is really that they, you connect with them. And I think this, this quote really uh, points that out whereby, you know, someone's really spending a lot of time on the numbers, which is good, I guess, to an extent, but there's a time and a place for that. They have to really believe and want to. And I think that that's part of the journey about finding the right ma match between an investor and an entrepreneur is really people that are somewhat of a kindred soul looking for the same, uh, looking to solve the same problem in a certain way. They may not know the answer, but they both deeply believe in the problem. They believe it's right. And I think that that's um, often underestimated the importance of that. And uh, people don't realize how much a role that does that actually does play into certain businesses getting either funded or even, even getting the right employees and the right team. So I thought we'd talk a little bit about the, the market at a high level and, and what's going on here. Um, so this is the last large consumer market in the world that's being disrupted by technology. Um, 67% are of the working age, 60% contribute to consumption. So it's, it's a consuming economy. And I think that that's uh, really important. It's a country that is built on inefficiency. Um, if there's anything that we've done at scale, we've managed to produce inefficiency at scale. And I think that is, is phenomenal because that creates great opportunity for everyone. And uh, I think that that is, is the reason why we should all be really excited to be in this market and, and at this time where technology is enabling us to really cut through all of this inefficiency and find out interesting results. It's a market that's been driven by historically a license Raj that, um, that, that, that kind of permeated or perpetuated the idea of a, a no need to really innovate and I'm fine with whatever I'm offering because what's your option? Um, and on the other side, you've had a market that's really been grown through fragmentation with no real scale and therefore no real ability to invest in products. So on one side, there was no reason to invest and on the other side, there was no ability to invest. And I think that kind of inspired a Jugad mindset, which now today, as we look at where we are, has really brought us to a world where changes are happening in parallel. We've had growing uh, consumption per capita. You have increasing organization of retail. You have increasing urbanization, uh, technology, technology adoption coming about. And, and new business models are continuously being discovered, whether that's been freemium, uh, subscription, and being applied in new areas that we didn't think of in the past. Again, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this as, as we go. And really that fragmentation that I, I mentioned earlier and the, the fact that we've got a country that hasn't had a lot of these uh, brands kind of scale in any way is changing really because of technology and technology is bringing this ecosystem together. And we've seen that, especially through COVID where just in the first half of 2020, you saw a, uh, a 3X growth in non-grocery retail, a 2X growth in healthcare, FMCG and education. Overall e-commerce penetration grew 1.5 percentage points in a six month period which in previously took almost three years for that to develop. So I think that, again, COVID has been nothing but an accelerator in this. And consumer choices, as we look at uh, what they're, they're looking for, are being driven by the idea of what is making it easier for me, where am I establishing trust, what's affordability. And I think brand, by the way, or the bottom two are really built at the intersection of affordability and aspiration. So you've got the, the, the tenets of brand, which are affordability and aspiration, and you've got the, the, the conveniences and trust that uh, consumers are looking for that are really driving how usage is, is taking place. And aspiration is really driving consumption. Um, you look at the brands that are coming to India, whether it's a Muji, a Uniqlo, an Adidas, an Ikea, the, the, these are becoming more accessible. Now, I appreciate that you know, we're talking about a very small microcosm of the country when I'm uh, talking about these parts of it, but I can guarantee you that everybody's getting exposed to it. And that exposure is changing the, the mindset of what is it that people want to strive for going forward. Maybe not everyone's buying it, but they're definitely aware of it. And I think that when we think about brands, the, 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 the left-hand side that you see here, personal aspiration was what it was all about uh, for a long time. And I think it was really, that's all you really had to focus on. What am I making you feel like? How am I talking to you as a user? But I think that what's happening and what you're finding with the, especially with the younger generation, is that who are you as a company is becoming important as well. They are seeing the issues around them, whether environmental or social, and wanting to align themselves with companies that care and are aware about what those are. I think in the last year itself, uh, we had eight major cities experience some form of massive flooding 
Um, we've had social issues that have caused riots across the country and continue to do so, which everyone is well aware of. And companies that have been able to understand this have, have done well. So Patagonia is a great company. And for those um, inclined to read, there's a good book called uh, Let My People Go Surfing, which is by the Patagonia founder. Um, and it talks about the fact that their ethos as a business is to leave the world a better place. And they apply that to everything. This was an ad that they ran in 2011 saying, don't buy this jacket. And they actually told people, don't buy it. They ended up selling a ton of the jacket and they ended up donating uh, the massive portion of the pro proceeds to charity and to environmental needs. And they are, they're, they're infamous for selling customers, bring your product back to us, we'll fix it for you if you bought it from us. And so they, they are, they're built around that, they live by it, and yet they continue to grow and are profitable and, and are one of the, the, the more successful businesses in the apparel market in general. Speaking of apparel, again, there's an opportunity as we look at all this to think about how we can apply this, and which is Yash and I are fortunate to, to work together in a business where, where we're doing this in Bombay Shirt Company, where when you look at the industry in general, it takes over 1,800 gallons of water to grow enough cotton to produce just one pair of jeans. And the, the apparel industry is, is actually one of the biggest um, offenders of, of uh, pollution in general out there. If you look at what the large fast fashion guys are doing to generate about $5 billion in revenue, H&M holds $4.3 billion of inventory. Similarly for Burberry to generate about $3 billion in, in, in revenue, they hold about 1 billion in inventory. What's even more shocking, and, and understand, these are businesses that operate on 52 week micro seasons, or sorry, 52 micro seasons in a year. So every week there's a new micro season. You're holding almost, let's say 75, 80% of your revenue as inventory, yet every week there's a new uh, season coming about. You're then throwing product literally into the landfills. And whether it's your consumers who you're encouraging to do that, or you as a business, Burberry, as a matter of fact, went and lit on fire, burnt $300 million worth of inventory uh, last year, where they just said they, they actually just aren't going to, to sell it. They didn't want it leaking into the secondhand market. Now, when you look at what we're doing here at Bombay Shirt Company, we're trying, we're, we're building a scalable platform for custom made clothing. We're operating with no inventory, we're operating. Uh, in a business where you don't make anything until a customer actually orders it, which allows for you to say that, listen, my, my capital requirements in the business are going to look very different. My ability to not have to dump inventory is going to look very different. And so it's not just what's called greenwashing. We're not just kind of labeling it and saying we're sustainable and good. You've actually designed a business model around this very issue. And so we've applied that now across multiple brands. And, and since part of this topic is really about brands, we can talk about that as well, where We've, we've decided that we can use this platform and this, the infrastructure, the back end, the, the uh, operational overheads and apply it against multiple brands. And we did that with Cora as a jeans brand. We've done that now, which we acquired. We've done that with City Up, which is a streetwear brand, which we actually launched. And so this is, and by the way, this is a model that we've seen work really well in the food industry as well with a brand called Rebel Food. So as a, as a fund, we've been exposed to this in different areas. But you kind of realize that the infrastructure can be used to effectively address multiple customer needs and create that aspiration and affordability in different segments. So again, it's, it's about identifying unique insights and we, all these businesses that I put up here have done that. I think whether that's um, ID with this butter batter, I think this product packaging was really cool. That the idea of you just have to squeeze it, it makes the little hole in the center and you have a product. But Laura's entire business is based on design the ability to understand what the, the, the young Indian consumer wants in their everyday jewelry is something that, uh, that the team has figured, figured out and figured out how to institutionalize as a practice. Dunzo's ability to actually have the local and deliver everything and, and a tone of voice, which just makes you wanna, wanna Dunzo something. Um, they're competitors in many markets, but the, the love that that brand has and their communication is fantastic. And similarly, for Lenko with Furniture Rental and, and the idea that people wanna live better now. And I think that idea that making that affordable and accessible right now is really interesting. Um, another area we've seen this in is really in, in food. And I want to talk about this just because it hits on sustainability again. As, as you can tell, sustainability is a really important factor for, for us. And it's something that I think is important for all entrepreneurs to be considering and thinking about as they're building their businesses. It's not a nice to have additional value add. We're living in a world that's a bit messed up right now, largely because of many of the problems we've created. And if we continue to go down that path, I think we'll continue to exacerbate those problems. There's nothing stopping us from going down that path, but there's nothing stopping us from changing directions as well. And so we are in a, in a situation where we have to really assess what is our food situation here. 
And I think that, you know, we have an opportunity to build brands that can be more nutritious, can stand for greater quality. And, and that's what one of the, the other companies we work with, Way Cool, is doing. And the reason they're able to do this is not because they put a lot of fancy marketing into these products or spend a lot of money on shelf, uh, shelf space in, in distribution channels. It's because they reduce the wastage in the back end supply chain. So the 30% of total produce is wasted when it comes from the farmer to the customer. By, by automating that supply chain, by technology enabling it, by simply processing, uh, process enabling it better, they've been able to bring, bring that down to about 1%. That means better yields, that means better quality products, that means better pricing, and that means overall a better end, end product for the end customer. Nua is another business that in the feminine care space has been able to do this by talking about sanitary pads, feminine care, feminine hygiene, um, sexual wellness uh, going forward as well will be one of the, the, the areas we get into in a way that actually addresses issues where honestly in a country that isn't very open about a lot of these topics, they found tremendous success in being honest and building a community around them. Um, you can see it that the, the, the communication can make a big difference. And, and here again is a, a brand where they opted to say, look, let's stop talking about eight blades or eight, uh, eight, eight, yeah. Uh, five blades on it now, six blades on it, eight blades. It's not about that. It's about really allowing your customers to, to, to get the benefit that they want. Don't scrape your face, scratch off lottery tickets, not your face. Again, your communication in these matter. The business models, which is what I alluded to earlier, also make a difference. Now, if, if I were to start McDonald's today, I think that I would probably start it the way Rebel Foods does. Because, you know, nobody goes to McDonald's for the ambiance. They go there for the French fries. They, they will want that taste. It's the same everywhere in the world. It's crazy how that happens, but nonetheless, that's what they want. They don't want to go sit there in that chaotic, crazy place. And so you would cloud kitchens are the right way to do it. Similarly, instead of building a high street led retail presence with lots of inventory like Finish does, Melora's no inventory, negative working capital, designs change every week. It's, uh, it's, it's current with the trends. You don't have to have a business model that's difficult to evolve. And similarly for Lenko with furniture rental versus Ikea with heavy infrastructure and, and customers kind of buying stuff that they may throw out after a while because it's cheap enough to, for Lenko actually the rental model might work better. So you find the business model that makes sense and you think about it. And in India, thankfully, for a lot of these businesses, the incumbency was very low. There weren't, Ikea wasn't established when Lenko came in. The niche was there, but the online side was massively open. Uh, and again, McDonald's, Domino's, uh, Subway were there as brands, but for Rebel, a lot of other segments were open, which then allowed them to also get into these areas. So when we look at tech and brand as the two pillars that we think about in, in businesses, we think we, we see technology as the thing that allows you to either attack your distribution, your production, or your marketing. How do you get a cost advantage using technology there? Now, the brand, if you invest in correctly, allows you to either capture higher margin or get greater market share. Now that's the, the importance of brand. What is the differential price you can charge for the same product? And um, these are the two things that I think are important for companies to focus on as they build. Figuring out your business model in it. Um, marketplace is, uh, is, is one where you know, you're able to actually bring people together in different ways, suppliers, uh, uh, users uh, come together, they transact. Um, we've seen that applied in Droom, for example, in our, in our case, Airbnb, access over ownership, we talked about Ferlenko. Uh, on the other end, again, Netflix subscription, again, for Lenko does that there. Direct to consumer brands, we have a ton of those. But I think it's important to be clear which business model you're applying where. Um, just because Spotify applied a freemium model in, 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 the, in other markets, and it may not be the best answer of how to address the music opportunity, or maybe that's a lot to be learned from the freemium model, the way Spotify did it, and apply it to the education business, which we had done in a business called Imbibe. Finally, I just talk a little bit about the investor side of the world. Um, and, and I say this uh, tongue in cheek, but it is true. You know, you have to cultivate relationships. Um, I've talked about things that are important to me today. Sustainability, understanding how that makes a difference uh, in, in your business is important. I think really telling a story. Um, I, I think you've got to have that hook. You've got to keep people interested. Oftentimes, I find people have done really cool stuff. They just haven't thought a lot about how to talk about it. And um, they haven't thought about their audience well enough. And I think that you know, being able to bring products, features out in the conversation, having a bit of that discussion, um, being bold about what you say. Uh, I think people oftentimes feel like I've already taken a risk in building this business. Can I really be bold in how I tell the story about it? And I think you absolutely have to. 
It's about breaking the clutter. It's about getting out there with it. And I think it's important to remember that everyone thinks the world is going to be a certain way, but, but, and trust me, as investors, we appreciate this as well. I mean, th there are many more ditches and dips and, and holes than even this image can possibly show. And so it's a reality. And I think being prepared for that is important. So it is um, this intersection of values, business, technology, that's where you should really live. Um, finding that sweet spot, being true to who you are, that, that will allow you to have the tenacity to live through it and the ability to find a voice to allow your brand to stand for the things that you really uh, care about. So um, I, I think uh, we've all heard a lot of these, but I, I think this one was a nice one where it's, uh, it, it, it's really the ones not just who think that they can, but they, they go out there and do it. And I think that that's key. I think taking that chance and, and going ahead. So as we like to say, um, let's keep moving. And so, uh, Yash, hopefully that was a, a good starting point for the conversation from here. No, I think very interesting, Sandeep. Uh, Sandeep, the first question, I, I think before we get into brand building, consumer acquisition um, and marketing was you have seen various different times, various different geographies, various different consumers. If, if I request you to put that in a timestamp of how you've seen that evolve uh, in America early when you were in India, you did Future Bazaar, you did um, uh, InfoEdge, you evolved uh, to doing uh, those Bombay shirts of the world. Uh, like, uh, and I, I think in some ways I'm asking you to, uh, you know, summarize uh, how your uh, thought process evolved over 30, 35 years of your journey. Um, I think it will give a real good perspective to the audience over here. Yeah, so look, um, I started out back in the late 90s in the Valley. It was a dot-com boom. Uh, basically, um, you put dot-com at the end of anything, you put I at the front of it, you put E at the front of it, and you were taking off. And, and also, let's recalibrate. At that time, companies were going public and raising $30 million. Today, $30 million, in some cases, is a Series A or a seed round. So it was still a, a rational world to some extent. But um, it was still a new world. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of putting some thoughts together on crypto and, and what's happening with that also. And I think if you go back and think about it, the late, the early 90s, this internet was just this idea of connected computers. The most you could expect to do was send an email. Beyond that, really, what was, what was the use of it and what were people going to do with it? And to sit, sit there today and think about the fact that 30 years from then, what we're doing is walking around with computers. We're all actually working and learning and, and running schools and businesses entirely on a platform where I have uh, some 60 odd people on this conversation um, and, and we're doing sessions where we're talking to people was never envisioned back then. Yet there was massive euphoria. And I think that that's the, 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 the great thing about it is there's a, um, there's a, there, there was a willingness and an openness to just experimenting and trying. And there was also a humility to, to being able to say I'm wrong. And, the speed in which you were able to fail and, and continue to just move forward with things. And there's the, the mantra of experiment, fail, learn, repeat. And I think that that really governed the Valley in the late nineties. And I think that what happened was public markets were really excited about it as well. And you had great bankers that were able to tell good stories and companies went public and you saw just massive amounts of capital get raised. Now, the good thing about massive amounts of capital, at least for that time, uh, getting raised is that it gives you the resources to invest in changing consumer behavior. And that's what it was. It was incentives. You think about it. If I launch a new coffee shop um, and you launch one next door to mine, you're going to try to win customers from my coffee shop and you're going to offer a discount and you're going to get them there. And hopefully that discount will, sh you'll show them that your coffee is better. And then they'll say, okay, I'm going to stay and I'm going to buy Ash's coffee because Sandeep's coffee sucks. And uh, I'd rather have this one going forward and hopefully you retain them. Now that's what the internet game is all about. You try to get people to say, listen, let me get you to come in the door, come online, make a purchase. Don't worry. It'll be good. You don't have to touch and feel the book before you buy it. It's a book. It will be fine. You buy it. And you kind of encourage people to do it. And that was what that world was about. That world was about changing very basic customer behavior. And there were no models to look at around there. Um, you think about the majority of the people that came into the industry at that time came from FMCG companies. Uh, or the equivalent US CPG companies. And uh, they had been brand and marketeers in a different environment. 
Google wasn't around at the beginning yet. Search engine marketing wasn't a big part of the world yet. It was all uh, ads, banner ads, reach, CPMs, uh, cost per thousand impressions. Very, very different world. And, you know, that, that was, uh, and it moved really quick. I mean, we moved straight from that into the SEM world, the Google world, the mobile world. And I think um, I'm, I'm skipping through a lot of it because I think what becomes really interesting is then we came to India. And in India, you know, I remember the first presentation I put together in 2003, I talked about PC penetration in India and the rate at which we were going to grow PC penetration to equal China's PC penetration. And again, just like landline and mobile, PC penetration became irrelevant. And um, it was a, uh, it was just, it, it, we totally skipped an entire genre of types of businesses. And I remember people used to ask the question, um, are you going to invest in a mobile company? I didn't quite understand what that meant. And um, it's, it's, it's the same thing today. Are you going to invest in an AI company? I think every company needs to use AI. Every company needs to use mobile. And I think India moved directly into that. From an investing world, we went from a world with no capital. Um, when the guys at Clear Triple getting started, there was no angel capital in the country. There was no, really no institutional capital in the country, no seed capital in the money in the country. So raising $200,000 from anyone became really challenging. And to now where we have an, an, an exuberance of that. And I think the journey over that period from 2006, I would say we watched uh, people fly in and out. We saw funds come from abroad. People started to say, yes, there's a billion people here. Something must happen. Look at China, this is gonna follow suit. And I think really Alibaba's IPO um, opened the floodgates in a big way because people said, oh my God, this is what could happen. So let me get here. And I think suddenly you saw that, that kind of happen and that growth take place. And I think that um, India has been this story, unfortunately, of uh, just on the cusp of taking place. Things are about to come. Let's, let's see what happens next. And I think that we've now hit that point where the, the, the proof is actually in the numbers. I mean, it's, someone asked me another question the other day, what about all the unicorns being created? And, and I have a real problem with mythological characters. I mean, I think that, you know, it's much better to, to talk about business models and product differentiation and things that are there. But the, the great thing about the mythological characters, they, give, they, they bring a lot of money to the table, which again, as I pointed out in the late 90s, we learned is very useful in encouraging consumers to change behavior. So to the extent that more people have money, they're gonna spend, they're gonna help customers get exposed, they're gonna help encourage them to change their behavior. And I think that that's a, a fantastic uh, outcome of the entire thing. And so I think we are, if I would say 2005, we were uh, perhaps, toddlers or infants in the, the ecosystem of uh, entrepreneurship and venture capital in the, the world. Through the period of time, we became teenagers. And I would say today, we're probably getting close to being young adults, um, where we're, we're kind of hitting our stride, ready to break out and um, break into the world. And you're going to start to see companies go public, stand on their own, um, demonstrate the, the, all the training they've been given over the years, so to speak. They're now ready to apply and, and move forward with. And I think we're, we're at an exciting juncture with all of that. I think there's a lot of work to be done on how brands are built. I think there's a lot of work to be done on product differentiation at a core level. But I do think that global competition will keep everyone honest and, uh, and ensure that that moves in the right direction. Uh, so let me break that down, Sandeep. Uh, how, how you've seen India from 2003 to 2021. I think I'll come to that phase, but if I go to the phase before, how was it? Uh, building the brand, uh, you know, building a music company back in America? Yeah, so look, we were building it at the time of, and I don't know if anyone here will know it, Napster um, and mp3.com, which were literally pirates of the, the web. They were enabling you to share media files without any rights. Um, they weren't compensating artists, but it was, uh, it was, it was, it was, doable and uh, was available. And so when we set out and, and I was a young entrepreneur at that time and a friend of mine and I said, look, we want to build a digital living room. And our, our dream was to say, look, we can host all the media in the sky. You can have your pictures, your videos, your movies, your music. There was no cloud back then. You know, all this cloud non non nomenclature and all came much later. It was, uh, so we just call it the sky, it would be a virtual digital living room. And we said, look, it makes sense to align with a, um, with a record label, <coughs> excuse me. And so we felt that getting the rights to the content was gonna be important because Sony, 
BMG, Universal Music, and all come together to sue all the uh, the independent platforms. So a a um, Napster, an MP3.com, a Kazaa, a LimeWire, we're all getting sued. And so we said, let's go this path. And now the unfortunate reality is IP owners couldn't get out of their own way. They were stuck in wanting to protect their businesses the way they were. They didn't understand how it needed to change. Um, Sony as a group couldn't be more open about the platforms they wanted to use. If you think about it, Sony had all of the pieces required to build a, an amazing ecosystem. They had the devices in Sony Electronics, they had the movie rights in Sony Pictures, they had the movie music rights in Sony Music. Yet they couldn't make the three pieces work together and it took someone like Apple, who had none of the three at the start, to come together and actually build the entire ecosystem. And, um, and I think that's a really unfortunate uh, outcome. But being in that world at that time showed us um, how difficult it is to protect IP, how challenging it is to work with people who have IP, um, but yet how valuable it is for consumers as a mechanism to get them to, to migrate and change behavior. And I think that that was really interesting to watch and observe. How Apple, and again, since we're talking about brand in general, there's a great, if, if anybody's interested in they should look at, just look it up online, Apple Silhouette ad um, for the iPod. It's such a, 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 a different ad that spoke about emotion, the emotion of music as opposed to the gigabytes of storage that are, 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 are available or the number of songs you're going to store. And I think Apple really created that opportunity um, and to, to change the entire conversation and change actually the entire conversation about Apple, quite honestly. Um, I think that really framed who <coughs> Apple became and how people saw Apple. Um, so I would say um, that, that, that was that, that time. And, and look, as expected, the bubble burst. Sony lost its... Uh, conviction behind the, the idea of building a music business and, uh, and we moved on. But, um, but it, was a, it was interesting learnings for sure. You were also part of Interactive Corp, right? Uh, I respect it for the brands uh, that it has created. Uh, like what was your framework then of looking at brand building, consumer, consumer trends? Um, yeah, you know, so I, I see was put together as a conglomerate of the internet. Um, the idea was, you know, if you could have a GE on one side, we could have an IAC on the other and kind of do the same thing. Be leaders in each of our verticals. And, and look, at the time that I was there, it was still early in the thought process. And um, I would say that the synergies were yet to be understood. I remember sitting in a product meeting where the heads of know, probably about 10 different product companies came together and we were talking about can we synergize the, the various uh, analytics tools that we're using, the project management tools that we're using. Can we get some value out of that? And people are, I don't want to change this and I don't want to do that. And the premise was really not about necessarily driving that. And if you look at IAC as a, a company, they've done a tremendous job of buying and selling assets. So quite honestly, I would look at them less as a, an operator, but more of a a very smart buyer and seller of, of companies. And um, I would say from time to time, they leverage that understanding to bring efficiencies. One of the areas they did a great job with was really understanding how search worked within Google. Um, what we did at TripAdvisor after we bought it and how we could use the ability to intelligently, um, to intelligently actually uh, look at how to, how to architect your pages so you're getting free traffic effectively. Um, and apply that in other verticals. So we did that in another company called Gifts.com afterwards. And so I would say that ISC has done a good job of using the data that they have in different areas to try to identify new trends, to try to stay one step ahead in different areas. Um, I would say they also do a great job of selling. They sold uh, TripAdvisor at the right point in time. They sold Expedia and Spined Out at the right point in time. They re recombine and re remix assets at different points in time. So um, I, I see them more as a, an interesting investor and an interesting uh, aggregator than necessarily a core operator in that manner. So Sandeep, and I'll just extend to that, say in 2003, uh, you came to India uh, and you know, Lightbox is an operating venture capital structure and you had worked with similar structures in the past like IEC. So what was your view for 10 years from 2003 to 2013? As, as you said, you were extrapolating the PC penetration that 
effectively got disrupted in some way. Uh, like, so if I, two parts to this, so 2003 to 2013, back then, if you go, this was the worldview and retrospectively, you looked at it, this is what happened, this is what did not happen. And from a company building perspective, from a, a consumer behavior perspective, it would be very interesting to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, hang on one second. I'm going to put something up here just to emphasize this point. Um, there you go. Right? That's, that is essentially what happened. I had a plan. I believe the world was going to go in a certain direction. We were very clear. We were going to have tons of people connected. We looked at when was the right time to start businesses uh, for when they were started in other markets, specifically China. They started about two, three years before PC penetration hit a certain level. So we were right on time for that. We were going to build these companies and they were going to all go straight up. And sure enough, none of that happened. And you know, sure enough, we found that the, the rate of uh, growth online was much slower than expected. The, the rate of growth of transacting customers was much, much slower than expected. And so it took, it, it, everything just took longer. I mean, honestly, it's not that the fundamental need wasn't there. It's not that the fundamental need was wrong. It's just that what we thought would happen within seven years is now unfortunately taking 15 years. And I think that that had happened. We're now at a point where everything from this point forward is going to accelerate a lot more. I think over the last 15 years of being in India, I've continuously had to say this time it's different. And uh, I think that that has become kind of the tagline. If the tagline for the country's fragmentation, the tagline for, for me and Lightbox has been this time it's different. And uh, I think that finally we've reached that point where it is different. And so thinking in 2003, what I thought it would look like today, I thought we would be all well beyond having any conversations of when will the first company really go public from this space? When will there be regular liquidity and exits? When will we just, I thought we'd be talking about just, it's, it's, it's routine at this point. You just, you know, suddenly lots of companies are changing the world on a regular basis. It's amazing to see the number of businesses. And we do have that. It's important to just, we just haven't hit the scale till, till, till date. All that's changing. I think you, you know enough businesses. Uh, I know that, that, that you've been around and we've seen, um, and similarly we've seen enough that, that, that it's happening. So I, I feel like everything that we had hoped for in 2000 has now come to bear just on Indian standards, unfortunately. Uh, Sandeep, I'll shift context. Uh, you acted as the CEO for ClearTrip for about three years. I think it was 2006, uh, if I'm correct. Um, very different ecosystem, very different view of brand building, company building, consumer acquisition. Uh, what was your thought process uh, while playing the role of an active CEO at that point? You know, um, it was a it's, it was an industry where we had to keep raising money. So it was a, a game of, and it was interesting. Series A, which is around being us in, there was no no product, no business, nothing. So we're investing on a PowerPoint presentation. Series B was based on number of tickets we were selling. Series C, we finally hit the revenue line and people started asking that question. Series D came down to gross margin. Series E, people started to talk about EBITDA. So it's, it's kind of uh, the journey of, of um, running a business also runs through the PL at different stages based on where you are. And so for me, at 2006 was really about tickets sold and revenue. That's all I had to worry about. Margin wasn't even my problem. Either. So to me, it was because we had to keep raising capital. So I had to build a business that would allow us to keep growing the top line without breaking the bank. I had to build a business that would ensure that we were generating enough ticket sales and, and the mix was looking decent. But, you know, we had to actually just figure out how to keep hiring people. You know, we hit the 2008 financial crisis in the middle of that. We raised uh, about $18 million um, and literally uh, so two weeks later, the, the bottom fell out of the world. And, um, and we went from a business that the previous year burnt about $10 million to the, the next year we made $2 million in profit. And the year we made $2 million in profit felt amazing. To not be dependent on investors, well, I'm an investor, but for me to sit here and say this is saying quite a bit, I think to say not being dependent on investors is a fantastic thing. 
And so I think that that was my, my great uh, kind of accomplishment from a personal perspective to get the business there. And then the reality was, unfortunately, we then had the opportunity to raise more capital, that more capital brought along the idea of burning more again, and then you're back on the treadmill. Um, and so that uh, has unfortunately been the, the journey there. And today the travel market is um, very challenging and difficult. And so that's a whole other can of worms. But I would say um, the journey of 2006 to, to nine or so was, was exciting with the growth for a while and then challenging with the restructuring and then kind of liberating with the freedom that we had. And, uh, and I think that was a, a nice place to end, end the journey for me. And uh, how did you uh, think about, uh, you know, uh, a, a clear trip as a brand at that point? Uh, how did you think, how did consumers interact with clear trip then when you started, when you ended after three years? Um, and I, I think that will lead to my next question is, you've seen so many companies at various stages. Uh, you know, what is your sense when a company is at a seed stage, when it is at a you know, uh, pre-series A, series A, series B, and from a revenue perspective also, when it is sub 20, 20 to 50, 50 to 60, I think different form of channels have different forms of efficiency. So is there a playbook that you have that this is how a company should approach this? If I had a playbook, I think we would just be churning out uh, mythical unicorns on a, on a daily basis. I think that the market changes regularly enough that it's hard to. So I'll put it this way. At the seed stage, we look for um, the, the tenacity and the, uh, I guess, con the ability to connect with the, the individual. It's not about, it's not about having all the answers at the seed and series A. It's about, are we trying to solve the same problem? Do we believe in the same problem? Do we feel the same way about it? Do we, do we believe that it's a worthwhile problem to solve? Um, there's nothing like solving a problem that's useless. I mean, that, that, there's, there's no point in that, but if it's a, if it's something that we all feel good about and we all feel like we want to go down this path with someone. Um, that's what we're really looking for. As you get to sort of the B and C stage side, you have a lot more data points to, to validate things with. You have um, stories to look at behind how they navigated certain issues. You have historical reference points of crises that took place to see what they did then. I mean, I'll tell you, this pandemic is going to be a treasure trove of just interesting data points for people in the future to understand how everyone handled different, different uh, different difficulties. And I think that's a, a great reflection of the tenacity and the decision-making power that, that an entrepreneur will have. And so I think that um, the, 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 the difference in everything is really just the data points that you gather and your ability to then understand and look at why people made the decisions they made and how you may, how we may have made the decisions at those points and what, what we are able to learn from each other and whether that, that fits with our philosophies and thought processes. I don't necessarily um, think it's fair to apply, let's say, the lens that you would evaluate Akshay, a Bombay share company with, with the challenges and realities of his world with offline retail and to a, I don't know, let's say an online marketplace like Droom, which may not have the same things, or, or let's say uh, an online education business like Flinto in our portfolio, or something that has no physical presence like a Dream 11. Um, where, where it's very different uh, issues. So for us to sit back and say, look, stages or, or fundraisers or revenue levels might be similar across businesses, so therefore that it should have a, the same approach to it, I, I don't think works. I think you have to be very mindful and aware of what the nuances are, which is also why I think it's really important to take the time with entrepreneurs to, to learn who they are, learn what their business really is, and, and really be willing to invest that energy in figuring out the uniqueness of it. Um, so unfortunately, no, sorry, I, I don't have a good playbook to give. So uh, can I take two examples and can you run us through the thought of how you have been involved in that brand, uh, in that journey of uh, the consumer behaviors and how you've seen that evolve? So let's take Rebel Foods, which is more distribution first and uh, or you would have a better understanding and any other company, whether it is Flinto, whether it is Bombay Shirt, uh, and if you can wrap yeah. through your thought process on that. Okay, so let's take Rebel to start. So when we invested in Rebel, it was fossils. It was one brand uh, selling wraps and rolls. And I think we each got to the answer why it was an interesting business in our own different way. Um, at least for me, the way I began to understand it as an opportunity was 
we were going to build out a network of, of kitchens from which we would then figure out how to optimize margin. We never had the idea of multiple brands at the beginning. We said that this wrap stuff, okay, we understand how much revenue per user you make, per order you have. We have, at that point, I think we had 60 odd kitchens. Um, it's all right, if we can scale this up to 700 kitchens, that's an interesting network. And if we can figure out how to sell more than a wrap and a roll, like if we can sell I don't know, some breakfast, some tea, some coffee, some dinner, that should be compelling. And so that's how we can build it. Kind of think of it like a, a network, a telecom network rollout. Let's build the towers out and then we'll run more and more stuff through it. And that was a, the thought process that got me comfortable at least with the business. As we got going with it, we started to understand that selling uh, a person who's buying a 250 rupee wrap, a 500 rupee biryani was a bit challenging. The brand had been built in that consumer's mind in a certain way. And we actually went back and looked at the advertising. The advertising for Fasos was typically centered around a single man living in a dingy location. Literally, there was an ad where there was a guy who opened up the fridge in a dark apartment and it was a mother sitting in the fridge um, telling him what he should eat and, and all this kind of stuff. And it was just not, not built around the premium experience that a Beirut's biryani is, is today. And, um, or the, 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 I guess, experience that you were eliciting from Mandarin Oaks or any of these other brands that now exist. And so we debated a lot, actually, with Jadeep and the, the team at Rebel, can you upgrade the Fossil's brand? And we went through an, an interesting discussion where we said, could you upgrade Air India as a brand? How would you do that? And lots of theoretical, philosophical debates, discussions. And eventually, they did a, a test. And they just launched Beirut as a test. And they said, OK, let's see what happens. And I think they did Beirut and Oven Story together. And um, they found that. The, the similar biryani that they had been trying to sell under Fasos at a certain price point was able to sell under Beirut at that price point in a, in, in, a, in a heartbeat. They put a story around it, they put packaging around it, they created an identity around it. The value of the brand made such a difference. And I think that and that's when the, 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 the kind of light bulb came on and, and reflection started and Jadeep sat back and he reflected and he said, listen, people have different food missions in life. They have different things that they want at different points in time. They want them from different brands. You don't want your Chinese food from your pizza maker. You don't want your dessert from your biryani guy. You, you want things from different people and you want them in different ways and in different occasions. And so what we have again, is just interesting common infrastructure to be used across all of these areas. And um, that was uh, the, the big insight. And I think that's what then allowed us to think about the fact that you can leverage infrastructure, you can avoid the, the lumpiness of revenue that any one given restaurant may have. And by, by using that same infrastructure across multiple restaurants, you are really building a, a business not for the next five or 10 years, but for the next 300 years, because you're really just able to continuously adapt everything based on whatever the relevant trend is at that point in time, or whatever the relevant customer need is, and you can vary it by market. And I would say that today they've taken that a step further and really found a way to take that global with a presence in Indonesia, a presence in Malaysia, a presence in Dubai, a presence in uh, Nepal. I mean, you name it, now London as well. Um, so it's, uh, it was very instructive to, to be able to go like that. And I'll give you one more example because it, it, it speaks to the fact that you can't be rigidly tied to what your initial thesis was and, and you have to be willing to move with it um, as long as the the the, the general premise is still the same. Um, we invested in, in Mobi a, a long time ago. And at that time, um, the mobile ad space, our contention was India at that time had 400 million mobile users. Advertising was going to grow more and more in the mobile environment. So let's build a platform. Advertising would have local advertisers on it. So let's build a mobile platform that was optimized for India and, and kind of build that system here. And so we went in with that thought process. What we didn't realize was at that time, the, and we should have, the ad market in general was small in India and the overall ad dollars on mobile were still going to be small. So to get the business to kind of sustain and grow, we realized that if we're building a tech platform that was solid, the incremental cost of actually turning it on in a market like Thailand or, or South Africa was, was nominal. And if you build great technology, which we had, and the publishers that we were talking to, where people were accessing websites were in foreign markets, and we're also asking us, if you're gonna do India, can you do these other markets for us? Kind of said, yeah, okay, why not? 
And that's actually what, what became a fantastic opportunity and a great kind of uh, growth engine for the company. And because we were willing to go with that. So I, I guess, um, you know, contrasting these and you know, comparing them, it, you know, you see that you have to, you have to have a thesis that's broad enough of the space that you're getting into. Food with Revo, advertising with Inmobi, jewelry with Melora, furniture with Ferlenko. These are not small markets because whatever your initial thesis is, is going to be wrong. And you're going to have to have some space to evolve and iterate. And I think that we've seen that, uh, that everywhere. I mean, I'll tell you, when we invest in Bombay Share Company, as you know, there was no conversation at that time about, about multiple brands. It wasn't the thesis that we got in with. We got in with the thesis that we're going to build this one and we'll see how other categories emerge. Um, the, the, the fact that multiple brands has become such an integral part of how we think about the business there, again, is an evolution. And um, I, I think that people don't realize the importance of evolution. They see it as, it, it sometimes in media gets dubbed as it, they pivoted or they changed their strategy or they got, and absolutely you have to. That is what a startup is all about. If you're gonna remain stuck in cement in one spot, you might as well be a large company and, uh, and, and miss the opportunities. Um, and just, I think comparing, you know, early stage. So I just wanted to take an example of InfoEdge. You were one of the pre IPO investors over there. Uh, how did you think about it? InfoEdge had its own brands. Uh, it had seeded some brands like Zomato and Policy Bazaar. Uh, it would be very interesting to get your view, uh, what InfoEdge was then and how do you see these particular brands now in terms of Zomato and Policy Bazaar? Yeah, so so uh, when we invested in Forage, there was no Zomato or Policy Bazaar. There was um, there was Jeevan Sati, there was uh, Shiksha, there was 998. Um, but the business was Nokri uh, entirely. It was Nokri, and uh, and even Nokri's business was largely a, a homepage with lots of advertising. And but they had built a, a fantastic sales engine, and they knew exactly how to run that that, that company. And it was growing at a, a great rate. And look for me, I had come to India. We'd made our first investment in Cleartrip at the early stage. It was an exciting opportunity to invest in something at a later stage to learn what was happening at, at, a, at a different scale. Um, they were probably, probably one of the only companies at that scale profitable. They were going public. It was a chance to see what that, that opportunity was going to look like. And for Sanjeev, I think he saw in us an opportunity to bring some technology perspective um, to the board and, and to, the, to the team and some networking relationships that were a little bit different than what he already had. So um, I think that that was uh, the kind of mutually beneficial rationale behind the, the investment. I think that as a business, um, they realized that they had an opportunity to actually use a lot of the cash that they were generating to help build businesses um, around that they found interesting. Uh, I don't know that it was necessarily driven out of a, a set philosophy or a thesis that said, we're only going to invest in X, Y, Z type of businesses. They did have a view that they were going to invest where they had the opportunity to take significant ownership and be very impactful and, and help companies build in the InfoEdge manner, which was InfoEdge was extremely capital efficient as far as the business goes. I mean, for the market cap that they generated against the capital raise, I don't think you'll find any company who has raised any cap, uh, venture capital in India uh, be as efficient as they were. And, um, Actually, maybe zero dollar. Zero dollar is probably one of those that, that fits in that bucket as well. But um, I think that anybody that's gone down the venture path has unfortunately gone down in an extreme manner. And so I would say that there at that time, Sanjeev was, uh, I remember you made a, a joke one, at one point, some venture investor told him that um, if you're making profits, you have a vision problem. You're not seeing the opportunity big enough. And uh, just, it seemed crazy. I mean, he's growing at a healthy clip. He's generating 20% profit margins. I mean, I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. So um, I think that that, that, I don't know that he ever anticipated or expected. And again, I wasn't there when the Zomato investment was there. I think I left as we made policy bizarre. Um, we sold our position, which was in retrospect a mistake, but uh, and, and at that time I got off the board, but um, they, they, they did policy bizarre and then I think they, they were they, they were hard roads to travel. I mean, the insurance market was a hard road for a long time. And uh, I think uh, Yashish, I met uh, once or twice at the beginning, very smart guy, obviously uh, has figured out how to navigate the space extremely well. And um, I, I'm sure also due to the credit of Encoach being extremely supportive through the journey. 
So I think as a company, they have uh, great moral standards. They have great governance. Um, I have nothing but uh, great respect for how they run the company and what they do. Um, and I think they've benefited tremendously from that, both in terms of the way the public markets value them and uh, the types of entrepreneurs that want to associate with them. So I think um, it, it, it's a great it's a great company and a great journey to, I'm glad to have been a part of it. Uh, interesting. So Sandeep, I just wanted to switch aspects to capital efficiency. You know, there will be certain, uh, and how would you, uh, I think, uh, guide entrepreneurs to think about capital efficiency and capital allocation, how much capital to be allocated from a brand, from a consumer acquisition perspective, what are healthy metrics, what are the right channels to explore? Uh, it will be fairly interesting to get your views on that. You know, um, it's a it's a tough one because the the if you're in a business that requires massive scale um, to win, and I think you have to appreciate and understand what you are. Um, there are certain markets where being larger, quicker makes a difference. Um, marketplace businesses tend to have that dynamic, and so if you have to get big quickly, you have to really think about what's going to allow for that. And I think in those cases, I think um, investing and building and growing is going to be really important. Raising capital is going to be really important. That's the name of the game. It's, uh, if I think about, let's say, the, the, the people that have succeeded in the e-commerce world versus the people that have been challenged, the ones that have succeeded have been the ones that have raised a lot of money. They've been really good at raising money. And they're really good at playing that game. And so I think that you have to dis you have to understand what space you're in. Um, if we take a business like, uh, let's say, a DTC brand, there are going to be many brands. There, it's not a winner takes all system. It's a business where product differentiation should be what you're striving for, ensuring that the product creates a lot of pull, a lot of word of mouth, making sure that you're connecting with customers effectively. You're not worried necessarily that people are going to buy their last shirt and never buy a shirt in their life again. You're worried about making sure you stand for something. You're worried about your product being um, something that you can continue to build differentiation on over time. And so I think you think about your customer acquisition spends differently. So I would say that if I were in a situation where I had the luxury of being able to build my brand carefully, methodically, not in a winner-take-all world, I would put more of my dollars into product, more of my dollars into experience on the user side, and more of my dollars into customer retention and driving word of mouth as a key metric. If I were in the business that required rapid scale and knew that I would have to keep raising venture dollars, I would put more of my money into performance marketing, um, more of my money into Facebook, um, get big enough, quick enough to get some efficiency out of offline advertising as well, and make sure that I'm raising capital quickly enough for that. So it's not a one size fits all answer. It depends on the type of business you're building. And it depends on being honest with yourself about what business you have. If you're going to run a winner takes all business like a, a DTC brand and hope that you'll get there, you're going to get run over and you're going to be killed. Similarly, if you're going to spend money like a marketplace in a DTC brand, you're going to lose your customers very quickly because you're not going to be differentiated because acquiring a customer doesn't really mean anything. They're not going to stay with you unless you have a clear proposition that makes it worth it. So that, that, that's how I would break those up and, and think about them. Got it. And uh, Sandeep, when you're investing in a company as a VC, uh, uh, how important it is uh, and how do you see them seeing the consumer trends? Um, and if you can give us examples of uh, companies that you think have done well doing that. Of identifying trends? Yeah. Um, yeah you see, look, I, I think that, uh, look, all of our, our roles require us to try to think about what the world is going to be like five years from now, um, not what the world is going to be like now, or not what the world is today. And I think that when you take models like that, when you take models, and look, it's, it's, it's unfortunately very easy for me to speak about our portfolio, so let me start with that, I'm sure I'll think about this, but you know, the idea of furniture rental, um, a lot of people thought this is ridiculous. Why would I rent another piece of furniture? Why would that make absolutely no sense? I want to own my furniture. I don't want something somebody else has sat on. And you kind of have that thought process. And you look at it today and you look at what's happening in general. And I think the opportunity for Flamenco is tremendous. And I think what they've 
been able to inculcate in consumers and the idea behind um, swappability, the idea that one day your room is going to be your office, the next day it's going to go back to being a bedroom, the next day it's going to be something else. These are trends and ideas that I think um, you have to be willing to kind of accept there's underlying data two steps removed that may take you there. Um, I think that cloud kitchens, again, when we invested in it, Rebel used to run, Bossos used to have 16 stores that people used to actually walk into and take food from. When, when we invested, when JD said that, look, this is the model I'm going to pursue going forward, the idea of cloud kitchen hadn't been thought of. We used to call them ghost kitchens. We had no idea what we were talking about. We came up with that name, and then someone else came up with cloud, and that became the name, and now it's cloud kitchen. So, so I think that you know those people that have had the ability to sit back and deeply understand customer needs. Um, I'm trying to think of good examples uh, around me. You know, I would say in the physical world, for those that live in Bombay, um, I think that Bombay, uh, Bombay Canteen has done a good job of tapping into a, an underlying, I would say, connection with old Bombay and modern Bombay in a way that has created a brand that I think really resonates uh, well. Um, I think that, you know, they've, they've been able to bridge a gap and speak to consumers and they've extended that across Old Pedro and Bombay Sweet Company. And we see them kind of iterate on that and, and evolve with that as well. Um, I'm sure there's more. You know, I think business models have done a decent job of it. Lenscart has done a good job of just architecting their business correctly to be able to address uh, the, the opportunity in front of them. I'm not necessarily thrilled that the brand has done a fantastic job, but the economics of the business seem to be working really well. And, and that seems to be going, going well for them. Um, yeah, that's a few. I think, uh, you know, it's like, the, uh, I'm sure Shivani who's on here still would, would remind me of others that we've talked about, but uh, I'll go with those for now. So Sandeep, I just wanted to take your view on how things will evolve, right? So, uh, you know, there, there, there was an age where, or there, there are some consumer investors who still think that a good consumer company will need capital twice. One, uh, uh, when they are being seeded and the second, uh, when they have to grow. Uh, there are companies created like that, Pidilites of the world, uh, Page Industries of the world, uh, which are large consumer franchises, extremely profitable businesses. But there are second set of companies which are uh, Swiggies of the world, um, maybe Rebel Foods of the world, maybe, uh, uh, you know, uh, Meloras of the world, where uh, I think there's an, and it's fine to invest in those consumers when you have a view of how it will end. Uh, how, how, what is your view on this? Look, I think that the, the companies that are raising capital at this rate are trying to accomplish what those companies did over decades. So, in, and they're trying to accomplish it within, let's say, five years. They're trying to get to scale much faster. They're trying to address the market much quicker. They're saying that, listen, okay, I, I, a very simple way for me to put this is, if, if <clears throat> each of those businesses decided to grow in a profitable manner, they would just grow much slower. And if you go back and look at it, and we said that at those times, let's say the, the, the more traditional businesses and, and what the, their ecosystem looked like, perhaps competition wasn't as rigorous, perhaps reach wasn't as easy, perhaps it, it was limited in certain ways and they got to a certain scale organically over a long period of time, then, left, then built out infrastructure that's allowed them to since then be able to grow at a consistently good rate. But it, the initial phase of let's say zero to one or even one to 10, was it spread out over a, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 year period. And, and, and then from there, they built the infrastructure that allowed them to take the business up from the 10 to 100 phase. And I think these businesses are all trying to go from zero to 100 in two years. And so they're then therefore, by, by virtue of that, investing in the infrastructure, the, the, the processes, the teams, the technology, everything required to run a business at 100 while they're still at zero or one. And so that's going to create the burn on an ongoing basis, and that's going to require the capital. Now, good or bad, there are people who are willing to invest behind that story and buy that idea because they've seen great success in other markets doing that. And you're finding that the opportunity is that the companies that are making those investments are architecting their businesses 
considering the tools and technologies that are available today, as opposed to the people that are trying to retrofit businesses from the past to be more, I guess, competitive or stay on par with it. And the, the, the race is really, will the new guy get through his burn and scale up fast enough with his fancy new infrastructure before the old guy retools his backends to be able to effectively address the customers that he already has? And other markets have shown that the new guy tends to get there faster. And I think that that's what the bet is. And that's why people are willing to sustain that, that, that type of investment in burn. So that's why you have people saying, sure, I'll give the Swedes, the Zomatos, the Rebels, the Meloras the money, because I think they'll get there faster than a Domino's or a Titan or a Finish. We'll figure out how to re repurpose in the direction. And you are seeing that happening, uh, Sandeep. Like, Globally, yes, but in India, are you seeing that happening? Are you seeing, uh, you know, uh, people moving from large, valuable companies to early uh, 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 or growth or seed or venture companies? And I, in case if you want to share some examples. Yeah, I mean, look, whether it's uh, people moving, sure. I mean, this is a, every time the market gets hot, the conversation comes and I get a phone call from a, um, reporter that talks about people moving back from the US to come join Indian companies or people leaving uh, large FMCG companies to join startups and all of that happens and then when the market overheats and people start leaving again and get a phone call again and you start talking about that. So that's an ever going, it's a revolving loop. And, and I don't think we can assess the health of the market necessarily based purely on that. I think what I, I can see is that the numbers of these businesses are growing in a healthy way. They're still nowhere near the scale at which those other companies may, may, may be but they are rapidly moving in that direction and they're demonstrating that they're, they're able to use their, let's say, um, 2020, 2021 infrastructure as opposed to the 1990 or 2000 infrastructure that those other companies may have in an effective way to, to create something. Now, the jury's out in terms of whether that will fully deliver on bottom line profitability in the same way and all of that. But I think we're getting close to it. And uh, I think we're gonna, we're gonna see some things over the next 18 to 24 months that are gonna demonstrate that companies like uh, the various auto businesses that are filing to go public, whether here or abroad, um, whether it is the software companies that are filing to go public here or abroad, it's all gonna be revealed now and it's all gonna be seen. And I think that's gonna be an exciting next phase. And that's why I said that the, the Indian market is moving into its uh, early adult phase where you're gonna have a whole new set of companies out there standing on their own and showing the world that, yeah, it actually is possible. So yes, we're, we're getting there. And from a scale perspective, Sandeep, so that I, I think we take your views on this section. Uh, uh, you know, in 2004, when Hill House invested in Tencent, I think the market gap was about $2 billion, uh, if I'm not wrong. Um, and I, I think it's 100, 150 X of that. Like, what is your view on what are the size of the sum of uh, some of these Indian companies that it can become? Uh, like, if I take, for example, and maybe uh, uh, at the expense of being biased, if you look at the Lightbox portfolio today, how do you think that portfolio can be from an impact perspective, size perspective, ten years out? So, listen for us, um, we 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 are the uh, ever optimistic people in the world. Um, alongside our entrepreneurs. So I will always believe that we have the chance to redefine every space that we're in and grow them into massive businesses within each of the markets that they're in. But look, let's look overall. We have, we have fundamental challenges at a more uh, country level. We have to grow per capita income. We have to grow the overall economy. Um, and unless that sort of uh, 5 trillion mark gets met and unless we start seeing some of these things happen, you're not going to see the three hundred billion dollar company or the one trillion dollar business. It's just not viable. And so, but that's fine. That doesn't mean you're still not able to build exciting good businesses and create interesting returns. Um, Reliance is a very large company in, a, in an interesting market, and they're doing good things. Can there be more companies like that that are addressing the market in an interesting way? Can the growth of the economy come in new sectors where there's a shift of dollars that are going out of traditional sectors, while the new dollars coming in are also coming into this? So. As we go from the two and a half trillion or so to the five trillion, can the majority of that growth actually come in sectors that are technology driven and technology enabled, where thereby creating an economy effectively the same size as what we have right now in a totally digital tech driven world? I think absolutely. There's no reason why. 
There's a reason why a large part of that can't happen in some manner that enables it. But we have a business called Waypool that operates with farmers. I mean, we're touching the agri space. The agricultural economy in this country is massive. And I, I, I firmly believe that technology will play an important role in how that's made more efficient and effective. And I believe that there's going to be very large companies that are built there. And so I think that in order for us to realize the gains that we want to see as a country overall and, 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 the, and the uplift that we'd like to see society incur, we, we would like, we, we need these technology businesses to deliver the benefits and efficiencies that are, are needed in the economy. And right? that's the only way it's going to happen. It's a, it's, it's a hand in glove. It's two, two hands tied together sort of situation. It's not going to happen one without the other. If we continue to operate in the old models, we'll continue to fall behind and we'll lose our positioning. Someone had, had, <clears throat> had sent around an article or a clip once that said that the tech companies of, of today are like the East India Company of the past. They are the imperialist rulers coming in to steal the country from underneath us, and we need to be more protective of the world. And, and this and that. And, 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 I, and I think that that's unfortunately just a terrible way to look at it. I think that we need to up our own game, and we need to build the companies that will actually play and, and create the businesses that will actually dominate externally and will actually go out and leverage the uniqueness of India to build models that are going to define. And again, I say this just because I'm close to it, as Rebel is doing. I mean, Rebel is clearly built a, a, an understanding how to deliver in the cloud kitchen world a series of brands that nobody else in the world is doing. And I think that based on that, we can go out and build very exciting large businesses. And we will wait for the country to grow here or we will feed that back into the country here and grow the market here, which will then allow other businesses to grow. But we have to have a, a mindset of the economy growing. We have to have a mindset of openness to make that happen. If we're gonna go and going to operate in a closed manner, I think it'll it'll destroy everything. We'll have no chance. So the 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 short answer to your question is I'm, I'm extremely optimistic that we'll see large businesses, but I'm extremely uh, dependent and, and reliant on there continuing to be an environment of openness to enable that to happen. That's an interesting answer, I would say. Um, uh, Sandeep, what are the trends that you think are ripe for disruption? Um, and, and what are those consumer trends that you see? Uh, and those are spaces that you're extremely excited about, that you don't see a lot of companies uh, uh, answering at this point of time. Listen, I think um, the good news about India is we have mastered inefficiency. So like I said, it's everywhere. Um, I, I, you, you couldn't name me a sector where I can see, I'm looking outside my, my window, I see construction going on, construction going on. They were pulling down scaffolding yesterday. It was amazing to watch. They literally, there were 20 people on all the bamboo sticks, one on top of the other, untying them, the ropes, throwing it down, one person, one person on the ground and 20 people carrying them down the road to somewhere else where eventually I'm sure it got loaded on a truck and went, I mean, wow, it was insanely labor intensive and, and just crazy, but um, there's got to be a logical, better way. And maybe it's not in that aspect of it, in some other aspect of it. But I, you couldn't name an industry that's not going to benefit in some way from it. Now, if I were to look at the areas I would love to see it make a difference in, I'd love to see more impact in healthcare and in, in education. I think these are under addressed by the government and the areas that, by the way, the government having addressed it in other markets hasn't been a good outcome. The two sectors in the U.S. where costs have gone up consistently over the last 30 years have been uh, healthcare and education. These are the two sectors that the government has highly invested in, in the U.S. And so you can just see, I'm not looking for government investment here. I'm looking for actual more private investment and openness um, to, to be able to actually address this in a, in a way that's not regulated in any manner. So I think we have a tremendous ability to actually create, create a difference there. Um, and so I would like to see companies get in there and, and, and shake things up. And, and we're doing that. We recently invested in a mental health business um, where you know, the amount of investment in mental health is abysmal, whether by the government or by private industry. And yet the need in the country is massive. So it's not just about, and I'm sure we can build an interesting business model that's going to make money, but I think we need to think about it again in the context of if we want the society to progress, if we want to see changes take place, if we want to see growth sustained, we're going to have to ensure that the rest of the infrastructure moves. And if it's if it's the government, if the West has shown us that the government is not the best allocator of capital to these areas, 
we should be very happy that we don't have to convince the government not to invest in these areas. We should just now start to embrace the fact that we should start doing it and creating models that will hopefully deliver great results. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's what I would say. Um, and I think now I just wanted to get your sense on what people call India One and Bharat. Like, how do you contrast consumer behavior over here? Uh, and how does, I think, and how should uh, early stage entrepreneurs look at that uh, if they're trying to build a company for both? Sorry, Yash, I, I had my son just walking. Can you just repeat that? No worries. Uh, I think India One and Bharat, I think, has different consumer trends, right? Um, like what is your view over there and um, uh, you know entrepreneurs who are building for a or b what should be their approach uh, from a consumer acquisition brand uh, and reach perspective you know we uh when we set out with melora we thought that we were going after india one let's say or secca and um what we found is 40 percent of what we sell and now we sell a lot of jewelry is being bought in tier two and 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 lower cities. And the average selling price in those cities is actually higher than what we're seeing in metro cities. Um, so I think this idea that, um, let's say Bharat is not willing to spend or not willing to buy is not necessarily true. And also the fact that, that let's say metros are willing to spend irrationally or at high prices is also not true. I think everybody wants a good deal. That's across the board. I don't think that, that there's a, I don't think that there's any doubt in my mind that it's, it's harder to make a premium product in this country than it is anywhere else. To extract value for just premiumness is, is a challenge no matter which uh, demographic you're going after. So given that, I would say that I think that one, no matter what your market is, the, the value for money needs to be clear as a proposition. I think second, um, I think that access or lack of access is a massive opportunity enabler. And therefore your ability to charge um, charge for it. And again, that is value for money. Again, just giving access to great designs, giving access to product that is um, certified and, and guaranteed in a way behind with the brand that's behind it is value for money, but it's, it can be premium as well, is, uh, is, is also there in rural markets. So I'm not willing to put a massive um, differentiating lens on it generically. I would say that you, you do have different use cases, you have different customers, you have different customer profiles, but honestly you have that in metros among different groups in any case. So I don't know that it's, it's, it's simple enough to say, if you're going for rural India, you have to think about this way. If you're going for metro, you have to think about this way. I think you have to think about the use cases very independently, no matter where you sit. And even within metro, you have to think about use cases differently. Within rural, you have to think about use cases differently. So it, it, one answer doesn't fit at all. Noted. Noted. Um, Sandeep, uh, I, I think uh, it was wonderful having you. Uh, I think your perspectives is something that I have always looked up to. Uh, your views uh, have been very consistent uh, through everything that you do in life. Uh, and you have inspired a lot of early stage uh, entrepreneurs and created a lot of value and impact. So thank you so much for that. And thank you so much for taking uh, time out here for everyone. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, like I said, I, I always enjoy your, your questions as well. They're very thoughtful and well, well, well uh, researched and, and allow me to kind of force me to reflect a bit as well. So thank you for doing that. And uh, I, I'm, I hope uh, everyone enjoyed it. Yeah. For everyone out here, tomorrow we have the Farm Easy founder, uh, Siddharth Shah, um, uh, from 11 to 1230, uh, uh, who would be covering uh, the a health journey and how they've created one of the largest health ecosystems in the country. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for taking out the time. Time pass, I'm going to go to the camp.
नौकरी ऑफिस का काम चलते रहेगा बिना वो जिंदगी पर चलते रहता है 